Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, good afternoon, and welcome to the uh, 2022 Ian P. Howard Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, this is the first of these we've had since the pandemic, so it's uh, a real pleasure to welcome you and see you all in person. Uh, this series was uh, introduced in honor of uh, Ian P. Howard, who was the founder of the Center for Vision Research here at York University. He was renowned for his work in visual perception, including two seminal books, one on spatial orientation and one on deaf perception, that still influence the field today. This lecture series, the Ian P. Howard uh, Lecture Series in Vision Science, was established in 2006 to celebrate his enormous contributions to the field and to the international reputation of York's vision science and the Center for Vision Research. Following his death in 2013, we renamed the uh, series to the Ian P. Howard uh, Memorial Lecture Series. We are very pleased to have members of Ian's family here with us today. His wife, Tony, who many of us know, uh, was very involved in the Centre for many years. <laughs> and Ian's son, Mark. Uh, Ian and Tony, uh, among other things, hosted very legendary parties after uh, CBR conferences. Uh, and many, many of you will remember uh, uh, interesting and exciting times at, at those parties. Um, right. Uh, apologies. Uh, yeah, so uh, in this lecture series, we try and honor the most interesting and influential uh, researchers in vision science and invite them to come here and speak to us. Uh, today, we honor Dr. Sabine Kastner as the 2022 Ian P. Howard Memorial Lecture Series honoree. Dr. Kastner is Professor of Neuroscience and Psychology at the Princeton Neuroscience Institute and in the Department of Psychology at uh, Princeton. She studies the neural basi basis of visual perception, attention, and awareness in healthy adult primate brains, as well as in patients with brain lesions and during development. I had a quick look at Google Scholar before I came and noted that her work had been cited over 25,000 times, just uh, one indication of the tremendous impact that her work has had. Uh, Dr. Kastner serves on several advisory, advisory and editorial boards, and in particular is editor-in-chief editor of Progress in Neurobiology. As well as her research, she is passionate about outreach uh, and has been active in activities such as fostering the careers of young women in science, promoting neuroscience in schools and public education, and exploring the intersection of visual neuroscience and art. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kastner to give this year's lecture, Neural Dynamics of the Primate Attention Network. I take the long way, it's safer, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for giving me this honor uh, to give this lecture today. So um, I looked actually at Ian's Wikipedia page and I learned that he used to put his visitors on a rotary platform um, to have them you know, do some live studies and I'm very grateful that that didn't happen to me today <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not sure you know, how I would give my talk up in, in that instance. So thank you uh, again for coming in this large crowd. It's, it's just very, very exciting to give a lecture like this again after all these years. So thank you for coming out. So let me introduce uh, to you the uh, topic that I have studied for my entire career, um, and that is the, mm, the mechanisms uh, in which we select visual information from our cluttered environments. And so um, I always like to start uh, with this, uh, or one of the pieces of art by René Magritte because I think it encapsulates um, the nature and the essence of vision. And as a tra trained vision scientist, I still kind of you know, embrace that very much. So here we see the canvas that the artist has left in front of a window at the end of the day. And we've probably made all kinds of assumptions about what is behind that canvas in the occluded space. And many of you will say, well, it's probably exactly what was captured on the canvas. But there's not really much of a clue that that is true. 
there could be an entirely different scene behind that canvas. There could be a mountain scene or a flock of sheep or you know something completely different. But what it tells you about how vision works is that it is this back and forth between uh, what is in front of us, the physical cues that we take from the environment, and our assumptions of what that environment should actually look like. So it's this back and forth between our internal expectations that are built on experience and on motivations, on ongoing behavior and so on, and what is really out there. And um, this has a very deep philosophical dimension, this essence of vision. And Magritte, like many other visual artists, knew about this um, very well when he turned this <coughs> painting, The Human Condition. Now, what I have studied for many years um, is how we select visual information, specific visual information, like the canvas, um, from a scene like that. Mm -hmm. And one way to do that is to recruit a spatial selection mechanism. So this is schematically shown here. We you know, refer to this as a focus of attention or a spotlight of attention in our textbooks. Now the characteristics of the spotlight are that um, the selection operates only over a relatively small part of space, of the visual space in, in front of us. Um, what we can do is we can move it around dynamically, and we do that either overtly by shifting our eyes along, or we can do it covertly, that means by just shifting this focus and not our gaze. And that way we can acquire the uh, information <coughs> that we need in order to reconstruct that scene. So yeah, I have a little bit of a scratchy throat today, so I will have to get more water here. Um, so I will uh, tell you today about this uh, spatial selection mechanism and its neurosis. <coughs> Um, and I will exclusively talk about the covert part, so the part where we actually do not move our eyes along with that focus of attention, simply because the neural mechanisms for these mechanisms, overt and covert attention, are quite overlapping, and we basically you know, confound them or we cannot tease them apart if um, we study both at the same time, at least. Um, uh, I cannot do it. There are many people who try to do that quite successfully. Now, we study these uh, questions in two brain models that you see here, the human brain and the macaque monkey brain. And in the human brain, we study um, the adult brain as well as also kids' brains. So we have become interested during the last five or six years to also understand um, neurocognitive neurodevelopment better, better, but I will not uh, tell you about that today. But you uh, can ask me about it if you're interested in that topic, if you like. Now, what we do is that we take behavior as the glue between all these brain models. So we typically take an experiment from human cognitive psychology that has behavior that is very, very well characterized, and then we train macaque monkeys and see if we can establish a similar behavior in that species. And if so, then we can take that behavior as a clue to make inferences about the detailed mechanisms that we learn about in the macaque brain that can inform how these may look like in our own brain in a closer way. And I will give you an example in my talk today. Now, we link then behavioral measures to neural signals, and these can be a variety of neural signals, uh, from neuroimaging uh, or from electrophysiology. And the electrophysiology we do intra with intracranial recordings or recordings directly from the brain, also in humans, and I will introduce that later on. These are epilepsy patients who undergo neurosurgery, typically, um, so I will introduce you to that. Uh, in a little bit, and then in the macaque brain, we do our recordings from multiple sides. Now, I want to start uh, to sh show you kind of what how this vast network that we see uh, that's activated during a spatial selection of the kind that I introduced earlier, how that looks like in a human brain, 
uh, with an animation here, if I can get this to work. <coughs> so I'll tell you what, what we're looking at in a moment. So this is the right hemisphere um, of the human brain. This is the occipital pole here, and this is the frontal pole. And we're looking here at an inflated version of the cortical sheet from a kind of a bird eye view. And what you can see are fMRI signals that sweep through this brain during a visual selection and a spatial attention task. And you see this build up here over the occipital cortex, so this is the visual system proper. And this is followed then by this build up of fMRI signals in higher order cortex. This is the opened intracorrhinal sulcus here in the human brain that gets massively activated. And there are also frontal regions um, that will get recruited. And this is in addition to a lot of subcortical regions that will also get recruited. So during a very simple spatial selection, we basically recruit a vast network that spans all major lobes of the human brain, as well as the subcortical structures. Um, and what we try to understand is what the computations are that are done in these multiple nodes, at least we try to understand some of them, and we try to understand how this network um, sets up communication, talks to one another basically, um, within, uh, to, to basically drive behavior on a time scale of just about 300 milliseconds, that is typically how long a selection like that takes. So this is an enormously efficient network, and we try to understand um, how it basically works together to drive behavior at that time scale. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about how we can break up this network to get a first glimpse of what the different functionalities in this network may be. And I want to refer to a very old uh, experiment that I did when I was a postdoc in Leslie Unger-Leiter's lab. Many of you know that Leslie died during the COVID pandemic. And I think now it is time for us as a field to celebrate her life as a scientist. And um, this is why I would like to dedicate this lecture to her memory. Now, the experiment that Leslie and I did at the time was very, very simple. Um, and um, we basically asked subjects to maintain fixation here. Again, in none of the experiments I'll tell you about, there will be a shift of gaze. So gaze will always be stable. Um, then to direct attention, as schematically shown here with the spotlight, um, to this peripheral location in the visual field, and simply to expect the onset of a stimulus. And then that stimulus would um, appear here, this array of stimuli, with a delay, and the subject had to make a selection um, in this location of a stimuli that would change there randomly. So basically, we have here a period where we have the direction of attention without visual input, and then the direction of attention with visual input. And what we found was uh, quite remarkable. So here I show you these are fMRI uh, studies in human <coughs> subjects. This is from uh, the human area before. And what you see here is that uh, during this expectation period, there's a strong increase of activity. So this is not a visual signal. This is solely driven by a cognitive operation, by the direction of attention to that peripheral location. And then once the visual input comes in here, you see a further increase of activity in this visual area. So we see basically this staged pattern at the time, in the late 90s, this was extremely uh, exciting because it was one of the first clear demonstrations that you could drive a visual area just in a cognitive way, and you would not even need visual input to drive it. And this is an enormous effect here. Now, in contrast, what we saw in higher order cortex was quite different. So this is from um, an area that a lot of people here are interested in. This is the human frontal eye field. So what we saw there was that this increase in fMRI signals was much stronger during this uh, expectation period without uh, visual input, but then it was sustained. So whether you have visual input or not did not really matter that much in that area. It seemed to be completely dominated 
by the cognitive operations or the direction of attention and space itself. And this was also true for a lot of the parietal regions that um, I showed you earlier in this animation. Now from studies like that, what we basically have derived as a very simple model of attention is that there are these uh, higher order regions in prefrontal cortex and in parietal cortex that seem to control um, the visual representations um, here in the visual system and send down some kind of feedback signals that then modulate the ongoing processing. So we basically have a set of higher order control regions that have some kind of control over the sensory uh, representations. Now I want to show you another piece of evidence that supports a, a top-down model like that um, from our human intracranial recordings. <coughs> I did here a very simple experiment um, to uh, basically take advantage in, in our electrophysiology studies of a property that the visual system has that is very unique and that is space. It represents space in topographic ways and in confined ways. And so here we simply use this light dot, so again, uh, subject of just uh, maintaining gaze here, we present a light disk to different parts of the visual periphery. Um, I show that here. And then we record from you know, any part of the brain uh, to simply see whether there is a spatial profile that we derive from uh, presenting these light disks. And so this is a broadband signal here that we measure in the human brain. I will get back to that later. But for now, everything that is bright red is a very strong response. So we get a, str <coughs> a strong response here at that location and also at neighboring locations. And as we go away from that peak location here in the lower right field, you see that these responses um, peter off and are not present anymore. And so what we have here in this ECOG recording is a spatial response field, very similar to the receptive fields that we know from the um, non-human primate visual system. Now, what we can do in our experiments now is we can direct attention to that response field here. Uh, that would be in the remainder of the talk, the attend to res uh, response field or attend in condition or we can actually direct attention to the opposite location, which would be the attend away from response field or attend out condition. The important thing is here that we do not change the attentional state of the subject. The subject is attending to different locations in the visual field, but we use the spatial selectivity here of this recording side to compare uh, the attend in and the attend out condition. So, very simple experiment here. Um, we show here to the uh, receptive field this uh, shape stimulus here, and then again we will direct attention to that response field and away from it. And so, this is a recording in the human brain from area B2, so low level visual region. Um, and what we see here during these two conditions is that there is an increase in activity and attentional response enhancement um, in the condition when the shape stimulus is processed in the attendant response field as compared to when subjects are attending here but the same stimulus is, a, is still in the response field. And uh, the significant deviation of these two lines here, the red, the attend in, and the blue, the attend out condition, occurs with a latency of about 270 milliseconds in this study. Now in comparison, what we see in higher order cortex, so this is a recording from um, a region in the entoparietal sulcus, very posterior, it would be equivalent to the lateral entoparietal area in the monkey. What we see here in this higher order area is that there is a larger response enhancement um, so the attend in uh, condition evokes a lot more activity and it occurs with a much, uh, a much uh, uh, slower latency. So you see here, sorry, with a much faster latency 
of, of about 140 milliseconds. So uh, what this again uh, speaks to is that this IPS region here may produce some kind of feedback signals that then send back to lower order cortex and the latency difference that we see here uh, may be an indication of that. So this would be another piece of evidence from electrophysiology in the human brain. In um, the non-human primate brain, there have been a lot more uh, causally convincing and not correlative uh, experiments uh, that also speak to that same model. Now, what I would like to uh, do today in my talk is to tell you about some new experiments that we have done to look at the functions in this uh, frontal parietal control network um, and uh, how it operates um, in uh, doing this selection uh, process. So I want to go back to uh, the Magritte painting for a moment. So when I um, described the spotlight of attention to you, I said it operates only over a relatively small and confined uh, spatial extent here. Uh, but the way you know I introduced it to you is that once you allocate it, um, you take in what whatever you know is in that spotlight. So here it would be part of that canvas in a uh, sustained way. This is how we subjectively experience when we allocate attention what we take in. Now, I want to show you today in my talk that um, this is actually an illusion. So once you allocate attention, what really happens is that the spotlight goes to phases um, where you take in more visual information um, and other phases where medial view, and this is a posterior view. Um, and here in, in this particular example, you end up with a really good coverage if you combine data of you know, 800 to 1,000 electrodes. So it's a very rich data set that gets generated that way. And since my interest is primarily in the extended uh, human visual system, what we have done is we have um, our own atlas here that we created based on um, fMRI topographic mapping in healthy uh, adults. And then we can basically probabilistically project uh, these electrodes onto this atlas. So these are all the known um, you know, areas that uh, have to do with visual processing in some ways in the human brain that we know of at this moment in time. And then we get at least you know, partially a better idea where some of these electrodes decide. Uh, this atlas, by the way, if you're interested in it, has, is freely available <coughs> and can be plugged into um, major fMRI uh, uh, analytical tools. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit um, about the signal we're actually looking at because it is very different from uh, the typical signals that you uh, know probably from non-human primates. So this is an evoked potential, but this potential uh, is again um, recorded from one of these surface electrodes. They are several millimeters in diameter, so there are thousands of neurons that feed into the signal, so it's much less localized than, for instance, a local field potential in the, in the monkey brain that you pick up you know, with a sharp electrode. And what we do with the signal is, so this would be one trial, this is the raw signal, we filter it in the frequency domain and then you can um, you know, identify like slower components in, in uh, this field potential and um, faster components. And the signal that I will um, focus on here in the human data is a high frequency signal above 70 to 90 hertz. It goes all the way, you know, um, as much as, you, uh, as, as your system can collect. So very often up to 200 hertz or something like that. Um, the signal can be thought of as multi-unit activity in a very, very simplified um, thinking about it, but it's a good proxy just for the purpose of this talk to think about it in that way. Um, so this signal in 
in this human electrocorticography uh, data sets is so powerful that you can even look at single trials in your data set. And I want to show you that in the ugly driver task that we probed in these patients. So here is again the schematic of our uh, task. I will put you through that again in a moment. This is the recording side. It's one of the posterior parietal cortex higher order regions in the human brain. Um, and this is one trial uh, from, from the side here. So what you see here at this point is the um, onset of the cue. So that would be uh, this frame over here. So this is the cue evoked activity. Then the um, gray line um, denotes up here to this broken line the Q-target interval. So in this particular trial, it's relatively long. The broken line indicates a time at which the target at special is shown. And then the, um, the green line over here is the manual response of our patient. Now, what you see right away is that during the Q-target interval, that's of course what we are interested most in, the signal here, the high-frequency broadband signal, is not flat but it fluctuates in this rhythmic fashion um, you know, quite a bit. And this is, of course, kind of reminiscent of our behavioral rhythms. I want to show you that this is not the only trial we found in our data set or something like that. So these are, this is the same patient, just two uh, other trials here um, with you know, different Q-target intervals. And you can see these fluctuations in every single trial you can see it even here um, when this is a very brief interval, when uh, actually the, uh, the patient is not responding, so here the patient missed the target. Um, but you see these fluctuations here too. And I'll get back to, uh, to this case um, in a little while. So the first question that we had at this data set was, what is that rhythm here that we are looking at that fluctuate, that modulates the high frequency broadband response and leads to these fluctuations? And to get at that, we did a peak trigger, trigger average analysis. So the idea is very simple. You take a peak and you take a 500 millisecond window before and after, then you shift over to the next peak, do the same thing and so on, and you average across a lot of trials and um, you can do electrodes, whatever you like, patients. And when we do this analysis, so here's this, um, this peak, it was actually done on the, on the raw signal, this is why the peak does not exactly align, um, and this is the 500 millisecond window before and after. So this is a one second uh, time window here, and we fit this uh, raw potential um, with the sinusoid here, this gray line, and you can see right away that this is a four hertz neuronal rhythm that modulates the high frequency broadband response. So now we have um, a four hertz <coughs> neuronal rhythm and we have a four hertz behavioral rhythm, uh, but that doesn't mean that they have anything to do with one another. This could just be a coincidence, basically. And so we wanted to find a way to link this neural signal uh, tighter to behavior, uh, so to find a way that that neural signal could make a prediction about behavioral outcome. And what we looked at for this was actually the phase of that four hertz rhythm. So just to explain that analysis intuitively, so this is the phase here um, at which that a modulation arrives at the time when the target is shown. Uh, so here, in this trial, we are close to a peak. We are close to a peak here as well. But here, actually, when the patient is missing, we are in a trough. So we wanted to see whether the phase of that 4 hertz or theta rhythm would be predictive of behavior. And probably, if it was not the case, we would not have arrived at this part uh, of my talk. Um, of course it is. So here is, uh, again, uh, an analysis uh, shown. So this is the phase of that four hertz rhythm. This is the hit rate, and this is actually one of the more dramatic cases that we see. So you can very clearly see that there is a very poor phase at which the detection rate is very low, and this is flanked by, by a good phase where the detectability is much, much better. So now the phase of this 
four hertz neuronal rhythm uh, can inform about the uh, behavioral outcome in this probabilistic way. So we, ca we call these kinds of relationships here phase detection relationships. So the phase predicts the detectability. And we ask next where we would see at which recording sites we would see phase detection relationships. And um, interestingly, here's uh, just one patient, but this holds for uh, other patients as well. Um, we see the strongest ones here in these hot colors, uh, again, in front of parietal cortex, or so in these higher order regions that have a lot to do with the control of attention. So, um, what I've shown you thus far from the human brain is that high frequency broadband power is modulated by theta oscillation, oscillations across the frontal parietal network, and we saw that target detectability depends on theta phase. So in the remainder of my talk, I want to show you um, just some of the data that we have collected in non-human primates, um, simply to make the point how much further you can push uh, your research and the interpretation of your data in an animal model. Um, so what we did in these recordings was, um, so the human data basically had, <clears throat> had pointed us to these frontal and parietal regions that uh, seemed to set up these phase detection relationships. Um, and so we thought it would be a good starting point to record from these regions. And uh, famously in the monkey brain, the frontal eye fields and the lateral antiparietal area have been implicated in, a, in a attention function uh, quite a bit. Um, and this is where we recorded simultaneously um, in the every driver task. So the way this frontal parietal network is typically depicted in our textbooks and in our concepts is that it is this control network that's doing something magical. I want to depict it as something much more simple in a way. Um, and I would like to make the case here um, just looking at the response properties of neurons in these regions. So what we see in these regions um, are actually two networks that come together. One is the downstream visual information from visual cortex, and that is reflected and these neurons here, which are responsive to visual stimuli, but they do not respond during saccadic eye movements. And the other network that comes together in the frontal eye fields and the lateral interparietal area is the ocular motor system. And that is reflected in these neurons here that respond to saccadic eye movements, but not to visual stimuli. And then you have a hybrid of neurons that show both of these functions. So what I would like to argue for is that these attention rhythms have the function to resolve the functional conflict that these two networks have to resolve in these regions. So if you want to sample information from the environment, you should not move your eyes. And if you move your eyes, you cannot sample um, information from the environment. So ocular motor neurons and visual neurons in these regions need to be coordinated to make this process efficient. And I want to make the case that this is what these attention rhythms are for. Um, so I will show you a few data on that. The first thing that we needed to establish in our monkey recordings was that there are phase detection relationships like the ones we had seen in the human brain. And that is the case. It's plotted a little bit different, but this is theta phase here, and this is the difference in hit rate. So you can clearly see that here in the frontal eye fields at 5 hertz, um, there is a phase where behavior is 4% uh, better at special than at this phase over here. And we see the same in the lateral interparietal area as well. We see it actually also in the thalamus where we have recorded and in B4 where we have recorded in the meantime. So this theta rhythm seems to go across this entire network and um, orchestrates uh, behavior and, and setting up these relationships here. Now, um, as I said, this sets up a good 
theta phase and a poor theta phase with regard to behavior, uh, to the detectability of the target stimulus. Now, what we can do in these much, much richer data sets that we have in non-human primates is we can also look at faster rhythms um, that we can pick up in the local field potential. And that's what we did. And then we also looked whether these faster rhythms would be associated with the good or the poor phase. And I should mention that these faster rhythms are also predictive of behavior, so they are also linked very tightly to behavior. So what we found in the frontal eye fields is that a beta rhythm, um, you know, uh, 15 to 25 hertz roughly, was associated with the good theta phase. There was nothing during the poor theta phase. Again, this beta rhythm, this faster rhythm, is predictive of behavior. In the lateral anteparietal area, we found a slightly or significantly faster uh, rhythm that would you know, uh, encompass some of that beta frequency but would go into the classical gamma frequency, so up to 40, 50 hertz here. And again, this rhythm is associated and predictive of good performance. Um, and then in the poor phase, we see actually an alpha rhythm uh, that is predictive of poor. Uh, behavioral outcome. So now we have a lot of rhythms here that we know from the um, EEG literature and humans, from some literature and non-human primates, um, and how can we make sense of what's going on here? So I first want to kind of summarize where we are and give you a few more data points that I didn't show you. So we have this theta rhythm in LIP and uh, FEF, and this theta rhythm across the network is space <coughs> synchronized. And then we have the, this strong beta rhythm associated with the good phase in the frontal eye fields, and the gamma rhythm in the lateral interparietal um, area. And these rhythms are actually controlled by the theta phase, so the strength of uh, the power of this rhythm is controlled by theta. They're coupled to one another. Um, and we have, you know, this alpha signal, which there's a whole story about it. I could have given my entire lecture just on this, but I decided not to. Uh, but you can ask me about it. So I will not uh, talk about it much, um, uh, you know, in going forward. So um, this is kind of where we are, but it's not clear what it means. What, what do all these rhythms mean? Um, so by looking at the neuronal response properties that I introduced to you earlier, by dividing the neuronal populations in the frontal eye fields and in the larval interparietal area into their functional properties. And then asking how they are linked to these rhythms, I think we got something that's more interpretable. So here are these uh, different um, uh, functional uh, units again. So the visual, uh, the movement, and the vision movement neurons. And so what we found was that um, the visual neurons are coupled um, to gamma activities, so to these gamma rhythms that, that we had seen in the local field potential. Um, and so specifically, the spiking activity in the lateral interparietal area is coupled within LIP and also uh, within FEF to gamma activity in the local field potential. So one way to interpret uh, that is that the visual neurons feed their information forward to FEF, routed into FEF, using uh, a gamma channel. And there are lots and lots of examples across the visual system that people have found uh, similar evidence for you know, right, routing and, uh, of uh, visual information and, and processing. Now, in uh, opposition to that, the spiking activity um, of the ocular motor neurons and the frontal eye fields was associated with beta activity um, within FEF and also in LFP. So this is a signal that seems to come from these ocular motor neurons and is sent to, um, to LIP. Um, you can call it a feedback signal, but you think it is more specific than that because in the motor system, uh, beta activity is typically associated with the suppression of movements. 
and here we think it's a suppression of our movements. So what we think, based on these data, is uh, the following model that we have here. Um, so we think that basically these rhythms indicate state changes. One attentional state, we uh, call it the sampling state, is a state that's characterized by an increase of visual processing um, and the you know, routing of, of uh, information through these visual neurons that are associated with this gamma activity to higher order cortex. And at the same time, you have a suppression um, of eye movements, which is associated with this, these ocular motor neurons that are coupled to beta. And this is then alternated with a state um, that we think enables shifting and is basically a motor emphasized state where you get a relative suppression of visual um, processing and a release of suppression from the ocular motor system. And then these states go back and forth. So when we proposed this, um, uh, we got a lot of uh, headwind, let's put it this way, from our colleagues. Because, you know, everyone said, why should a system be set up in this complicated way? It just sounds a little bit too complicated. And so, you know, we, we have thought about that um, a lot, but we think that actually these rhythms are probably the key or a key to understanding cognitive flexibility. So the idea is basically, rather than um, locking into a state where we, for, for example, would sample information from the environment, um, we um, go back and forth between shifting and sampling because we could shift attention on the fly. We don't have to get out of a state of sampling and into a state of shifting. We have every 250 milliseconds the opportunity to do one or the other. And we don't have to shift. We can continue sampling if that's what our behavioral needs are. And interestingly, we see these two states the sampling state and this um, shifting state very much exaggerated in um, ADHD kids and kids who have attentional deficit hyperactivity disorder. So you see kids, this is a spectrum disorder, but at one end of that spectrum, you have actually kids who are hyperfocused. They do not have an attention problem in the proper sense. They are hyperfocused on whatever they do, but they cannot shift to a new task. So they can play chess for hours, but you will never get them to the dinner table. That's their problem. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have kids who are hyperactive, who cannot find their focus and go just from one thing to the next. And we think they might be locked into uh, the shifting state, right? So those would be, in that thinking, would be the two spectra where you actually have individuals locked into states, and then their attention function becomes very, very ineffective. So um, let me just summarize my talk. Um, so first the, um, the monkey part. I have shown you that attention function unfolds over time and has rhythmic properties. Data oscillations organize uh, sensory and oculomotor networks into two alternating states for sampling sensory information versus shifting attention. And we think that these rhythmic properties account for the flexibility of the selection process. That is a hypothesis that needs further substantiation, but that is our thinking about it. And so more generally, um, I think it is important to, to take into consideration the dimension of time when we study cognition, because they put some really interesting surprises there. And attention is just probably one example here. Um, Looking at the dimension of time led us ultimately to a new attention model um, about these rhythms that I've spoken about today. And attention rhythms may be a hallmark of a healthy cognitive function, but that is something that needs to be seen. We are working actively in just behavioral experiments with ADHD kids, but that is a hypothesis that we, uh, that we try to pursue at the moment. And this was so kindly introduced before, but um, I always advertise our kids' journal, Frontiers for Young Minds, 
My goal is, wherever I go, that one or two of you will write an article for our kids, and they will review it and give you feedback. It's a really great thing um, for you know, public science education, and we write for uh, younger kids, so they are 8 to 15, late elementary school and middle school ages mainly. Um, and it has been a lot of fun. We have reached kids across the globe. We have tens, mil tens, tens of millions of clicks on this web page. And um, your article gets on average 5,000 clicks. So I think you're reaching more people in the world <laughs> than as professional scientists. Um, so um, yeah, this has been really a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing to do. And if you want to join it, um, just reach out to me and I can give you pointers. But um, with that, I thank you for your long attention span and, and all my collaborators and funding resources. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. We have a microphone here for questions. Thanks for the late talk. Sorry, sorry if I missed it, but um, so fixation was didn't change here, right? They're always fixated in, in all these experiments. But if you design a different experiment, could you find evidence for this shifting phase? Is that what you call them? So would there be? Do you think you would find evidence that? At certain points in time, people are more eager to make eye movements or maybe other motor actions. Yeah, I think that is you know another step for us to really go into a setting where we have uh, you know the dynamics of eye movements and can look at that directly. Um, so that is uh, something that we have not done yet, but we have a few data points there. So there are actually two relatively straightforward hypotheses that you can build around this, this model. I just put the model back here. Um, one would be that um, doing this phase here, distractibility should be higher than doing this phase here, right? Um, and that's true. So we have uh, behavioral evidence for that. And uh, the, the other uh, hypothesis that we uh, were able to test from the data set we have is that um, if it's true that this is a more motor emphasized state here, then you might also have more microsaccades here. So microsaccades may be more associated with this state than with this state. And that is true. So they do show basically the reverse phase detection relationship. So they're an antiphase with one another. So that's the evidence that we have at this moment in time. But the experiment that needs to be done is the one that, that you basically suggested to do. Uh, you know, these types of experiments under you know visual search conditions, if you like, to particularly characterize this state in, in better ways. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sabina. So this uh, slide has two cycles, which would occupy something like 500, 600 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. As you know, intersaccade intervals are around 250 milliseconds, which is about one cycle. So how does one cycle do so much work? Well, probably we can uh, have that in one cycle, but we cannot measure it as scientists in one cycle. This is why we have at least two cycles here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the short of it is that with the kind of analytical tools that we currently have, uh, we would be fools to you know, try to characterize one cycle, um, so we don't do that. Um, so we characterize a minimum of two cycles, um, and this is kind of reflected here. Um, I would expect that in one cycle the same uh, stuff is going on. And yes, it's very complex, but that's you know what we have at the moment to look at from our experimental data and the convergence we see in humans and monkeys. That's a good question. Over here. So your, your hypothesis that you end up with, I mean, ultimately you'd like to have causal evidence to test this, right? So just. Well, the general question is how would one do that? And my specific question is, 
is there some pharmacological way of, say, selectively knocking out one rhythm as opposed to the other and then doing behavioral experiments, for example? Yeah, that's another great question. You're absolutely right that that is the next logical step, basically, in, in the series of experiments. So we were able to link a brain rhythm to behavior. That was the first step. And then we learned enough about the neural basis that we can come up with a schematic model like this. So the next step um, in, in this uh, set of investigations is to build a closed loop system where we would basically read out the theta phase or the state of the system of the network in real time and then try to manipulate uh, the network. We will try to do that. Um, this is probably, these are not good candidates actually because both of these regions have relatively um, you know, defined connectivity, but it's not widespread. So the region that we are targeting for that is the pulvinar, or the mediodorsal pulvinar, which is, you know, interconnected with almost the rest of the brain. Um, and if we can manipulate the network, the cortical attention network, we think it can only happen from one of the subcortical regions. Um, so that's what we're working on. Whether it will work out, we don't know. Um, but uh, you know, we do that also with a translational um, focus here because there are now uh, quite a few attempts, for instance, to treat epilepsy with, uh, you know, thalamic stimulation um, to possibly treat uh, schizophrenic patients or depressed uh, patients. So this is a, it's very much coupled to a, to a translational um, idea that, that we are um, looking at, at these kinds of manipulations. Um, but, you know, this is a few years in the making from here, I would think. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the great talk. So your cortical attention network, or, or if I understood it correctly, you want to suggest that, or you directly suggest that attention is the slave of the oculomotor system. But uh, if you look at the uh, other nodes of the cortical attention network, especially this newly found temporal cortex uh, area, which controls attention in a way which is totally independent of eye movements, how we can incorporate that into the model you're suggesting here? Um, so first of all, no. I, I don't think, if, if you understood it that way, then I'm not sure that that was my intention. I do not see attention as a slave of the motor system. I see this really as um, a resolution or a mechanistic resolution for a functional conflict. And that is a conflict of orchestrating the ocular motor system and the visual system so that they do the right thing in time, right? So suppress eye movements when you sample and um, when you shift your eyes, you can sample or sampling is reduced, right? So it's really about the resolution of this conflict, what these attention rhythms are doing. So I wouldn't necessarily think about that, you know, as a slave of the motor system. Um, though, saying all that, I'm a big fan of, you know, embodied cognition, the idea that a lot of the principles that cognitive networks are um, using are probably informed from uh, motor, from the motor system, because it's, it, it, you know, evolves earlier than many other cognitive systems, but that's just an aside, but no slave here. Um, sorry, second part of your question. Uh, temporal cortex attention. Yes, um, so um, I'm not sure exactly what that area is doing. So we know that it is interconnected basically in a triangle between you know, frontal eye fields, LIP, and then this would be, you know, like a visual area, high level visual area, um, right down there, we know that it gets, you know, indirect input from the colliculus that goes actually to the pulvinar, interestingly. So here's an idea. It's actually something we're studying right now. Uh, we are very interested in that. And the idea is so these, these uh, projections from the colliculus to the pulvinar that then go into that part of, um, of uh, temporal cortex um, are unilateral. Um, and one possibility is that this is a shortcut signal that actually um, informs uh, the pulvinar, which is like the sensory, um, you know, main module, um, about the state 
or that the colliculus is in. So it's basically a modal signal that says, okay, you know, I'm in that state now, or I'm in the other, right? So it's a subcortical crosstalk about that informs about which of these states these structures are engaged in. So the colliculus will be engaged, particularly during this state, right? Um, so that, that is how I conceptually think about that, but this is a, it's very far-fetched. No one understands what these you know, subcortical bypass um, projections are doing, but that is something what, what we're looking at. So we're doing simultaneous recordings in the SC and uh, that part of the pulmonary at the moment to understand what these signals are that the SC sends to the pulmonary. So again, you know, in two or three years, I may have a real answer for you. Right now, I just have an exciting idea. Thank you very much. Not so exciting idea, I don't know. There was a question over here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your talk. Uh, sorry, I'm not very familiar with these things as I'm a math student. But as far as I understand, you wanted to link the signals with uh, behavioral oscillations. And uh, what I understand is your emphasis is on time scale. And time can be explained better in the mo motion. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether my question is correct by itself or not. Uh, I would like to know the dominant effect of uh, um, nor uh, visual neurons or movement neurons. Um, on what? Mm, on uh, uh, directing attention. And so basically, um, what we see is that um, in this state here, that is a sensory emphasized state, we see the visual processing, we see the signatures that also have been observed by other people of the visual processing channels being ramped up. So you see, for instance, this attentional response modulation during that period, you see that there's this enhanced gamma activity, and so on and so forth. So these are typical signatures for enhanced visual processing in the visual system. And then the ocular motor neurons are suppressed um, during that period of time. And here you basically see the reversal, so you see a, um, a release of suppression um, from the ocular motor system. And then um, the visual processing is actually relatively suppressed, and the, uh, the suppression um, has to do with this alpha signal here, um, because uh, the, the, the thalamus sends an alpha signal during this period that gates that information. So there's a whole other circuit embedded here. Um, and then once the cortex uh, reverses that signal, you go basically into a state where you can almost not process visual information anymore. But again, that's, that's a very different story. But that is kind of what, what's going on here. So the ocular motor neurons or the movement neurons, they are suppressed. The interesting observation that we made in our human patients is actually that it's not only the, what we see in, in the monkey um, where we did not probe, the motor system other than, you know, with these ocular motor neurons. What we see in our human patients is really quite bizarre. They are the entire motor system is actually in this kind of uh, state. So it's not only, you know, the, the hand that makes a response or something like that, but it seems to be kind of, uh, you know, uh, a widespread effect of the uh, motor system. So in the publication that we have on that, we have some of those examples, um, which, you know, again, this is kind of just a wild observation. There's no reason why the entire motor system should get into this kind of suppressed state. But that is what we observed in our patients. Um, I really like this model and wonder how it might be applied to, say, when there's a compound stimuli with two dimensions, um, mm -hmm. During the good theta phase, what would, I mean, in the task, uh, like we sort of discussed earlier, uh, with a given compound stimuli, sometimes you focus on one dimension, say shape, sometimes you focus on color. Uh, would, it, would, it, would this model also work for that? And then maybe perhaps we'll find a phase in which a uh, subject is more likely to make the correct choice of dimension and make the correct uh, response. So, 
I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but um, one uh, um, question could be if you have different visual dimensions in the environment, what would happen? Would they be linked to you know different faces, or is, is that could the question or yes? So in your task, you would have just one spatial cue, but now if that cue um, has two possible dimensions, it's a compound stimulus. Mm -hmm. Would the, this model how, how would it would it work and how might it work? I'm just trying to imagine if right. you could apply this. Um, no, I think it's a it's a brilliant question actually. So. Um, I think that most of these mechanisms that we are tapping into here and a lot of other mechanisms that people have described before um, have to do with competition. So if you set up a competition, so what we are setting up here is a competition between you know, different parts in the visual field that we can uh, attend to, namely these two objects in the sense. Um, if you set up your task as a competition, I think you engage in, in these kinds of uh, rhythmic shifts. So I can give you an example uh, that's actually what we're working on with our ADHD kids. There we have a four-wheel stimulus because for kids it's very hard to do this kind of covert attention stuff um, and not looking at the stimulus. So we have a four-wheel stimulus and it's a, it's a cloud um, of uh, blue and red dots. And um, if you set it up in a competition and say you will detect you know, a change in, in that cloud, um, and in that red cloud or in the blue cloud, you see these kinds of um, you know, fluctuations in behavior very, very clearly. I bet you though, if you set up the experiment as like a classical you know, Treisman binding experiment, that for some reason you bind these dimensions that are there together, you would have a different behavioral outcome. So I think this, this is again, this speaks to the flexibility of you know, all of these mechanisms that they can relatively easily be tweaked um, into something else. So it, it would really depend on you know, how you set it up. But I think if it's set up as a competition, you will see these fluctuations at the behavioral level. Thank you. Very nice talk, thank you very much. Uh, as I understand it from the picture you've got on the slide at the moment, you have these periods of distractibility. Is that is that is am I following that right? These the the or the uh, red uh, the brown part there is that a period of brief yeah. period of distractibility? So you, you could shift attention or get distracted during okay. a period. Of time. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering if in the in the natural world animals might have exploited that. It might not be so <coughs> relevant for a, a monkey that's going to tend to eat fruit and that stay still, but I'm thinking of cats and mice and uh, whether the predator, the prey-predator relationship may have somehow exploited this, these brief periods of, of um, distractibility, as you say. It's, uh, it's totally possible. Mm. Um, and you see in data about um, cats, but what you see in rodents, of course, is that they also use basically a theta rhythmic uh, uh, mechanism to exploit their environment and that's you know doing whisking and sniffing so that also follows you know similar rhythms whether they are you know underlying dynamics as we see them here we don't know but there could be you know it's very likely given that monkeys have uh, these kinds of rhythms preserved um, and these complex dynamics that go with them this is something that's probably goes back far in evolution, and it may not be in the same model system. So here we are looking you know, at, um, at the visual and the oculomotor system. This may be confined to foveal um, you know, species, basically, but it could be just in, in different um, sensory modalities where that is realized. That's absolutely possible. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Avina, for this great talk. I have a question, maybe like it's not so specific, but it's about as a starting, you know, faculty. I, I see these results, and, and there's this idea of like linking some neural phenomena to a established behavior. Um, but presumably, like it's just not oscillations. It's going to be like the neural activity. Like a lot of these components would play a role in whatever behavior is being tested. Um, so uh, linking it back to maybe Doug's question, like if we are gonna go in and do like causal perturbation, I'm worried about confirmation bias of like we, we see something and we, we will, in the case that 
actually a very specific cause of perturbation is possible, we'll see something and we'll be like, hey, that proves that oscillate or this part of the, you know, the theta uh, band activity or, or something else is related to the behavior. So my, my question is that how far or how specific is the link currently between different components of the neural activity to behavior? And should we yeah. make that link more specific and quantitative before doing the jump to causal experiments so that we can interpret the results more effectively? I'm not sure. I, I think the, the link of the behavior to uh, the phase of this slow rhythm, of this theta rhythm, that is overwhelming. We see it in humans, we see it all over the brain, wherever we record in the monkey. Uh, we, we can, so these phase detection relationships, that's the easiest part for us to actually establish. To kind of understand these dynamics is far harder. Um, but again, you know, we have a very firm uh, relationship that here at threshold, that's 5%. 5% of threshold is a lot, you know, you're shifting the threshold by 5%, that's what you're doing here, so the threshold goes, you know, far um, up there. And um, so I'm not worried about, you know, that, that link at all. I think that is very, very firmly established. Now, you can do closed loop um, simulation, um, let's say, during this period here, but the question is, what will be the result, right? So you could perturb the network and drive this further down, or you actually make it a lot better, so you drive this basically into a um, more of a sensory state, right? Uh, that would be the alternative. So I think that interpretation will, will not be trivial, and I think ultimately we probably have to do that stimulation and find a double dissociation doing it, let's say, in the pulmonar in the SC. Because that way I think you, you would, you know, probably find something more meaningful. But again, that is, and the whole experiment may fail because in large brains you may not get these kind of behavioral effects, you know, by trying to perturb a large scale network that we see in, in smaller animal brains. Um, so, but yeah, we'll see. We'll try. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. And um, I'll say I did learn a lot that I've really tried to avoid attention uh, throughout my entire career. Um, so I was thinking about this, but now what you've just said, I think may even answer my question. Uh, so I was thinking about the brain stimulation that we do in our lab, and do, do these rhythms uh, perhaps underlie some of the state dependence that you have with response to TMS? And then I was thinking, could you exploit them to enhance responses, whether excitation or inhibition? And I think you were just sort of suggesting maybe that you can do that. Yeah, so, you know, that might be one uh, way to think at least about um, uh, TMS and what it's doing, that it will basically make these kinds of states here, the shifting of the states, the uh, more robust than it was before, right? Um, and a lot of the uh, stimulation, at least these, um, uh, you know, protocols that are used in depressed state uh, patients and so on are all the slow, it's relatively slow, um, stimulation rhythms, right? Um, and so they could tap into, you know, functions like that and probably, you know, more complex uh, functions even. So I think that these rhythms are attractive, not only to orchestrate here this attention network, but you can also think about them that they come in handy if you want to integrate that attention network with a different network, let's say with a memory network, right? So you want to feed in what you sample here into a, a medium temporal lobe network, right? To put something into long-term memory. Well, if there is a theta rhythm in the medial temporal lobe, and we know that there are, um, you probably want to uh, align your encoding phase with this phase and your retrieval phase with this phase, right? But you could see that something that you observe here in the attention system may come in very, very nicely to integrate even other symptoms and orchestrate those as well in cognition. And you know, my best bet is that with TMS and interventions like that, we probably get at this level that is much, much more complex and integrates you know, across different cognitive systems and so on. So this is basically just a very simple prototype of, you know, of probably what there is, but that, 
that it's absolutely possible that it's happened to something like that. Could this overall pattern modulation be connected to heart rate? To heart rate? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure um, that, you know, because heart rate goes up and down a little bit, so it changes over time. If anything, if there's, you know, something uh, physiological at that level, and I don't want to actually write this off at all. I think we know very little about these kinds of, you know, relationships to autonom autonomous nervous function. Breathing is probably a better candidate because that stays, at least under these kind of experimental conditions, relatively stable. Um, and is also, you know, at a, at a slower rate, a heart rate maybe just uh, too fast. But um, again, we know very little about it, though there have been um, papers that have linked breathing rate with theta rhythms in the medial temporal lobe systems. Um, so I don't want to write that off. That would be very interesting to take a very close look at. That's great. I think we don't see any more questions. We're going to have our reception in a few minutes. There's also a couple of announcements beforehand, but I'd first like to thank Camina for a very interesting talk.